For this case study, we're standing in front of the patriarch tree in Grand Teton National Park, and as you can see, the colors are already changing. So what I'm doing is I'm actually using my Nikon DA10 with a 24 to 120 millimeter lens. And what I did was I actually stood a little bit further away from the tree so that I can compose it in front of the grand landscape. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a few pictures using my uh, polarizing filter, and that's really the only filter that I'm using because what I'm doing is I'm actually trying to reduce some of the haze that I see in the background. So let's take a few pictures and take a look at what it looks like. Now this is a very typical situation for sunrise where you have some color in the clouds and we're right about five or seven minutes before the sun actually rises. Now when that happens, we might see a little bit more color in the sky, maybe not, but one thing that will surely happen is the light will start hitting the top of the peaks of the mountains. And at that time, I might actually start uh, using more filters. And in this case, I might use a graduated neutral density filter or perhaps resort to an HDR technique in order to not blow out the top of the mountain. So let me talk about the framing composition here real quick. As I said, I'm using a 24 to 120 millimeter lens and I'm actually right at around 85 millimeters. And the purpose here is to try to show the tree in front of that grand landscape and not make it appear too big. It's a large tree. Now, if I were to use a wide angle lens, I would be really up close to it and I would exaggerate its size and perhaps even make it look a lot, much larger than the landscape behind it. And that's not what I'm trying to do here. So in this case, it's a really beautiful setting. I actually moved away from the tree about maybe uh, 100 yards or so. And by keeping this distance and then zooming into my subject, I'm able to make it look really proportional to the landscape. Now, in terms of my composition, if you take a look at the back of me, you can see that there's actually a V right there in between the mountains. And I actually have the tree composed a little bit to the right of the frame, while the left side of the frame is occupied by the, the Grand Teton, the, the, the highest peak that we have here. And because of that, the Grand Teton is actually a little bit overpowering just because it is the highest peak. And then on the right side, to balance out the framing, I have this tree. So that's basically my composition here. Here. Now it looks like the color is already reaching the peak and I'm going to take a few pictures and I'll get back to you in a moment. All right, we're back. The sun is up and I want to talk about what happened in between while I was shooting. Now I was hoping for some color in the sky. Unfortunately, I didn't get any. And part of the reason was because there was a blockage on the horizon. There were clouds right in front of the sun but something really cool happened in between, which is uh, at the right moment, uh, there was a slight opening in the clouds that allowed the sun rays to pierce through and shine light right on top of the peaks. And that was really beautiful because that allowed me to ha have an additional impact on the balance that I'm trying to create. Now remember, the left side is a little bit more overpowering compared to the right side, just because the peak is higher, but I have the tree on the other side. And with the color being on the top of the peak, as you can see in this picture, what I was able to do is I was able to achieve perfect balance. Now, this is not a simple balance that we've talked about so far where you're just having an element in the frame counterbalance the other element. This is actually a little bit more complicated because now we have two types of things here. One, we have a color balance where we have red versus green. And the other type of balance we have is dark versus bright because the peak is much brighter than the darker area of the frame, which is the tree line. And we also have the color red on top of the mountain balance the green on the tree line, which creates a really interesting color harmony. Now let's talk about the key elements of composition here. My tree is obviously my primary subject. That's what I want to highlight. But at the same time, the secondary subject, which is the mountain range in behind the tree, is what complements the primary subject. And for that reason alone, I have to be very careful about how I frame this particular image. Now, as you can see, what I've done here is I've actually separated the tree, which is my primary again, from my secondary, the mountain range by moving away from the tree and making sure that none of the branches or the tree trunk itself are actually interfering with my secondary subject and not cutting into it. Now it's part of the secondary subject, but I don't have any part of the primary subject cutting into the edges of the secondary subject. And that is a very important consideration that I kept in mind as I was trying to frame this image. 
In addition, I wanted to make sure that I have good subject isolation. And what I've done is I've actually made sure from where I stand that no subject is cutting into another subject. So the tree as my primary on the right side is not cutting into the evergreen line that's in the middle of the frame and no other trees or bushes are cutting into any of the key subjects which is important because in this case I, I actually specifically looked for this particular spot just to be able to achieve that. Another reason why this image works is because of simplicity. I've got a tree, I've got a mountain, a couple of bushes and that's really it. I'm not overloading the viewer with too many details. Now, as you can see, my camera is a little bit tilted. And the reason why I did that is because I actually established my horizon line as the hill right under the tree. And the hill itself is slightly tilted to the right. It's a little bit heavy on the right side. So when, as I was uh, framing my shot, I actually moved my camera to match that. Now, by doing that, I actually tilted the mountain a little bit, but that's not something that my viewer is going to be able to tell. Another thing you will notice is that I actually have now a filter on my camera. As the light was hitting the top peaks, I wanted to make sure that I'm not blowing out any of the highlights. While the scene was not requiring me to use any specific techniques like HDR, I was able to actually use a very soft graduated neutral density filter. In this case, it's a 0.6 or two stop filter. And I slowly moved it down until I started blocking some of the light that was hitting the top of the peaks. By doing that, I was actually able to uh, get a really nice exposure on a single frame that did not require any sort of advanced exposure bracketing. Now, if I had a very different situation where the clouds were so bright and they were really colorful, I might actually have a trouble using a graduated neutral density filter because in a case like that, I might have to resort to a three-stop graduated neutral density filter. And in this case, with the mountain range and the mountain peaks being so sharp and, and having that really difficult triangle, which with a GND filter is going to be difficult, as I slide it down, I might be darkening part of the sky and not the other part of the sky. In a case like that, I might have to resort to HDR. Thankfully, in this case, I didn't have to. But just keep that in mind. If you ever shoot in a sunrise situation and you have such a bright sky and you have an uneven horizon line with, cut with a mountain or maybe a tree, then in that case, a, a graduated neutral density filter might not be the preferable option. You might resort to something like HDR to be able to get the best exposure uh, for you to be able to later work on. In terms of my camera settings, I actually set my camera to base ISO of 64. That gives me the largest dynamic range that the Nikon D810 is able to offer for me to be able to work on recovering, potentially recovering shadow and highlight details in the scene. In terms of my lens aperture, I set it to f8 at roughly 85 millimeters is where I'm at right now. Uh, I have the tree already at infinity, so as I zoomed in with my live view and focused on the tree, I took a shot, made sure that the image looked sharp from the tree all the way to the extreme corners of the frame, which it was, so that was my setting for that. Now, in terms of shutter speed, that really uh, varied depending on the scene because the brightness levels were changing rapidly as the sun was rising, so I was making adjustments as the uh, brightness changed. As I was shooting, I set my camera to manual mode and I was adjusting the shutter speed so that my image looks as bright as possible and that's exposing to the right. So in this particular case, what I wanted to do is make the image bright, but at the same time, not blow anything out. So as I was taking pictures, I was looking and paying close attention to both the histogram and the blinkies that were showing on the back of the LCD of the camera. And by doing this, the purpose here is not to make the image necessarily look appear brighter but to be able to take the image later into post-processing and darken it a little bit to create to get as much dynamic range out of the scene as possible and to have a lot more options for editing all right i'm all done shooting here let's go ahead and take this image into lightroom and see what we can do with it all right, I'm ready to start editing this image. But before I do that, I'd like to give you some pointers. Now, when you're in the field and you're taking pictures, just by looking at the camera's LCD, you should know what type of post-processing the image will require. In some cases, the image looks already good enough that you know you need to do some basic edits. And maybe that can be accomplished by using purely Lightroom. In some cases though, as you take a picture, you know that Lightroom is not going to work. 
Maybe it needs some very complex cloning. Maybe some elements need to be removed or some other things need to be done to the image to make it look good. And in those situations, you might need to use Photoshop. Now with my Patriarch Tree example that I'm about to edit, I'd like to divide it into two separate sections. The first section is going to be editing the image in Lightroom. And that's where I'm going to try to make the image to look as good as I can within Lightroom. But I know that there are certain things that I might need to do in Photoshop. So what I'm going to do then in the second section of this case study, I'm going to take the image into Photoshop and do some more complex editing. Now, normally when I know that I need to edit an image in Photoshop, I'll probably do some very basic tweaks to the image and make it look as flat as possible so that I could do 90% of the work within Photoshop. However, in this particular case, I'll get started in Lightroom, get it pretty much there, and then finish up in Photoshop. All right, let's just get right into it. I've got Lightroom fired up here with five images. And although I'm going to only edit one image, I wanted to give you a couple of pieces of information that might be very important. First of all, take a look at this one image here. This image I captured at sunset the prior day. And take a look at how closely the framing resembles in all the other images. This shows that the prior day, I already had a goal in mind. I already knew exactly the type of framing I wanted out of this image. So the following day, I simply came back and I framed my camera pretty much exactly the same way. So this is a very important thing for you to keep in mind. As you go out taking pictures, that scouting process is important. And this picture really shows that I already had an idea and I simply came back and re-executed that idea. Now, if you look at these four other images, this is the beginning of the sequence. Then I have a little bit of more light on the top of the mountain, then a little bit more light. And then the last image shows a lot more light in the entire scene. Now, if you were wondering which one I would pick for editing, my candidate would be this one right here. Because what I like about this image is that it has plenty of light in the mountain, and that light is going to be a really nice balance in terms of the brightness compared to the darker area of the tree. Now, if I look at this image in particular, I don't like this as much because it's now more or less flat. There is not much balance anymore because the entire scene is lit with light. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick this image for editing. There are a couple of things that I want to do with this image. First of all, I do want to bring out this tree a little bit because it's a bit too dark. Obviously reduce the um, highlights here so that they get darker because as you can see, I'm already pushing my histogram a bit to the right. And then I'm also potentially overexposing some of these areas, snow uh, caps here on the mountains. Another thing that I'm thinking about doing with this image is making the sky pop out more. I know I've got some clouds in here, so I'd like to do is make them, uh, make them just a little bit more uh, come out. So in this case, maybe just add some clarity just to the sky so that the clouds could be more visible. And in addition to that, I do want to change the color of the sky just a little bit, maybe make it a little bit more blue so that it stands out from the scene. Uh, and then I'll do work on the image and do a few more tweaks. But overall, I think there are a few things that I can do in Lightroom already to make the image look better. So let's go ahead and get started here with the camera calibration. That's where I usually start, set it to camera standard. Now, in this case, like I said, there is a little bit of haze there in the background. And um, one thing that I typically do to my images is add a little bit of saturation through the blue primary channel. And I'll do something like plus 10 to plus 30, depending on the image. Now, in this case, if I add something like plus 20 in here, as you can see, if I do the before and after, it is adding a little bit more blue there, but it's also boosting the rest of the channels too. So it's not just the blue primary that is doing, it's also boosting my reds and the greens. So I'll probably leave it at something like maybe plus 15, just to be a little bit careful because I do have to deal with that blue haze later on. Um, but I do want, like I said, that slight boost of colors everywhere in the image. So what I'm going to do next is remove chromatic aberration, enable profile corrections. Let's take a look at what it does. As you can see, it's actually doing a fairly decent job. Not too much distortion to worry about, but also vignetting is not uh, too bad here. So I'm going to keep that on. And then as we come down to sharpening, I'm going to go ahead and pick a good area. And it looks like, you know what, this is actually pretty detailed right here to go off of by. So I'm going to go to uh, 0.5 radius 
100 detail and with sharpening let's just start from right around 25 and maybe right around 50 it looks like it's pretty good now if I push it more that's a bit, a bit too much but you know what in this case maybe just a little bit more would be good so I'm gonna push it about 60 all right with masking I obviously want to get rid of that uh, sharpening in the sky so I'm going to go ahead and turn on the masking and by holding the alt key I can move it just a little bit to get rid of that in the sky now as I do that you can see that here on the top left corner I do have some dust spots and dust spots is not something that you want to do in the very beginning you do not want to be removing those in the beginning of the process because especially if you have a dirty sensor and there's tons of dust on your sensor you do not want to be dealing with them in the beginning of the post processing because it will slow everything down so keep that in mind keep that as the very last step in post processing so masking about nine is going to work out pretty well let's move up here I'm not going to worry about colors at this time or the tone curve so we come back to the uh, basic panel now in the basic panel I am uh, looking at this area right here and it looks like as I said earlier I am pushing a bit to the right although changing some of the settings earlier already allowed me to reduce a little bit of that highlight information there so still I think my exposure is a bit too bright so I'm gonna push it down to maybe 0.15 just push it uh, to the safe zone and then from here let's work on the highlights a little bit and push that further down and as, as I push it further down you can see that the highlights are in fact getting reduced so maybe minus 65 is going to be good enough and I know that this all is in the shadow area so I'm going to push the shadows so let's just bring them up maybe right around plus 50 or so that's looking pretty good right there so next thing is to work with the whites and I've got a little bit of headroom right here so I, I need to be very careful about how much I push them remember the whites and the blacks are going to result in added contrast so the more I push these up and down the more contrast I'm going to get in, in this overall image but I've got to be very careful about how much I push so let's see how much we can push maybe right around uh, 30 or so is going to be pretty good and then with the blacks let's reduce them down just a tad I got to be careful because if I push too much then these areas right here are going to get too dark and then I might have to push my shadows back again so right around there I think that's pretty, looking pretty good this is the before and this is the after so so far so good the image is um, not looking bad at this point um, the white balance here if I set it to auto you can see that it results in much more orange I actually like the S shot white balance a, a, a lot better just because yes it's a little bit more blue but then at the same time uh, you know it's it's a it's a morning shot you know in, in the morning you expect to see some blues in the scene so I don't mind that maybe I'll push it just a little bit to the right just to get it more balanced so let's take a look at the before and after real quick that's before that's after I think that's looking much better now so right around there is good and tint I'm not going to mess with I think it's it's looking pretty good all right so at this point uh, let's take a look at the presence and these sliders well in these in this image to be honest I really don't think I need to add much clarity except maybe for the sky which I can do selectively for sure within Lightroom but I'll probably end up doing that in, in Photoshop so that I have a, a more refined look now let's take a look at what happens if I push clarity just a little bit as you can see as I start pushing it uh, in fact in this case a lot the sky does come back but then it makes the whole image very dirty so I'm going to go ahead and tone that down reset it to zero just so that I don't have to worry about it right now and vibrance I don't need to add more vibrance to this image it's already colorful enough now my uh, kind of idea with this image is to try to bring out the tree so I am thinking about already doing dodging and burning for this image maybe just burning a little bit of this uh, top area here of the mountain because it's a little too bright and then using uh, dodging here to bring out um, uh, the tree a little bit and make it stand out from the rest of the scene 
But in this case, uh, you know, my edit so far with Lightroom looks pretty good. I would say if I were to take this into Photoshop, this would be probably 90% there. Um, there are a couple of tweaks that I'd like to add to this. So let me come down here and there is a dehaze tool right here, which in, in this case, if you look at the distance right here, there's plenty of haze, which let's take a look at what happens if I start moving the dehaze tool uh, whether it's going to help or not. And as you can see, it certainly does help, but pushing it to something like plus 30 is kind of dangerous because now it's adding so much more contrast, especially in the foreground, which is not what I want. So there are ways to deal with this uh, selectively in Lightroom, but unfortunately, I don't think I want to go there because it would take me a significant amount of time to try to use something like the adjustment brush and, and bring that area uh, down in haze. So I'm going to probably leave it at something like plus 10 for dehaze. And uh, we can take a look now at before and after. And as you can see, the difference is pretty significant. Just plus 10 is going to make that much more difference in terms of how uh, the haze looks in the background. So at this point, I think the image looks fairly good. Another thing that I could do is maybe just uh, push out a little bit more contrast in here and see what kind of result we're gonna get. And again, as you can see, it does certainly help with the haze. Now what I'll do is, haze is not something that I normally reduce in Lightroom. If you absolutely have to, then by all means, go ahead and use something like the adjustment brush. And in combination with the adjustment brush, you can actually use the dehaze tool. But in this particular case, that's not something I want to do because again, I'm working with very fine details here. Look at this tree and all the edges of the tree. If I were to use that brush, not only would it take me a very long time to try to get all of this area into my mask, but also I would have to be very careful and it will take me enormous uh, amount of time. And for me, post-processing efficiency is very important. So I, the last thing I wanna do is waste a lot of time. So just because of that, I think I'm going to take that step into Photoshop. But for now, let's take a look at the before and after one more time. So this is the before, this is where we started, this is where I'm at right now. And the next step from here is to take this image to Photoshop. And uh, the very last thing, in fact, that I want to do before I do that, I just noticed that as I was talking, I see a little bit of vignetting on either side of the top frame. And that's not something that I want to leave. And definitely the spot healing stuff that I was talking about earlier is something that I want to take care of. So I'm going to go ahead and pick the gradient tool and go ahead and fix that issue in the edges here. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm just going to dial plus 0.5, just one stop, press O, remove that overlay. And now we should be able to, yep, that looks pretty good. And let's do the same thing on this side. Once again, just half a stop. In fact, half a stop there is a bit too much. Let's just do 0.3 and that looks pretty good right there. So in, in terms of the spots, it's always easier to just zoom into the image, but in many cases you won't be able to see the spots very well. And one of the ways that you can take care of that is as soon as you go into the spot healer tool, right here on the bottom, you'll see something that says visualize spots. And if I click that, as you can see, it kind of switches to the same thing that I was showing earlier when you hold the Alt key and you start moving it, it shows you the kind of a black and white mask. And you can actually move it here from the left side all the way to the right side. And at some point of time, you will start seeing these dust spots that need to be taken care of. So in this case, all I'm gonna do is select the heal tool here. And I know that one of the dust spots is right there. Go ahead and click on that and then select here, do the same thing here, and then get rid of that one there. And then the last one is going to be right here. That looks pretty good. Maybe move this guy just a tad down. Now, unfortunately, this process is very slow. Part of the reason why I typically prefer to do these kind of things in Photoshop because it's much more efficient in removing things like dust spots. But so far it looks pretty good, I think. Let's go ahead and uncheck visualize spots. And then I'm going to navigate back to that area where I was just taking care of those spots. Let's go ahead and click close. As you can see, 
I did a pretty good job there. So for the most part, the image is ready. Now, another thing that I told, told you about earlier that I wanted to do with the image was to make the sky a little bit more blue. That's something that I can do in Photoshop, but if I wanted to do it in Lightroom, that would be not a very difficult thing to do. So let's go ahead and do that here. I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the exposure back to zero, and I'm going to drop the gradient tool maybe somewhere right around here because the top of the sky is what I wanted to just add a little bit more blue to. And I can obviously move this around as needed. Now, one thing that I do, there are multiple ways to, for you to do this. If you already have some blue, and if you want to add more blue to the sky, you can definitely work with the saturation slider, but I personally prefer not to do that. In this case, I know that the color temperature itself could probably be the way for me to adjust it. And as you can see, as I move to the left on the top with the color temperature just minus 15 or so, if I undo and redo, you can see that it's adding quite a bit of blue to that sky. So the only thing you have to be careful about is if I start to move it down here, then it's obviously is going to add that blue to the areas of the mountain here as well, which is probably not what I want. So right around here, is going to be good enough. And let's see what happens if I move just a little bit more. Maybe that's a bit too aggressive. As you can see now, it's getting a little bit dirty right here towards the edges. So um, I'll just keep it at something like minus 15. Another thing that you can do is add the color through the color here. Uh, sometimes if you don't wanna mess with the color temperature, just by adding the color through the select color tool here will also uh, allow you to add that selective color. But in this case, as you can see, it's messing up a lot of things and I've got the mountains. Once again, I could work around these things by just uh, using the brush tool on top of that and then eliminating the mountains so that it's only affecting the sky, but I'm not going to go ahead and do that. I think just the temperature alone there is going to be good enough. So let's go ahead and close uh, that out and that should be fairly good. At this point, I'm fairly happy with the image. However, to make it look a little better, there are still a few things that I think I can do in post-processing to make the image look even better. One of them is going to be reducing haze in the distance, which I'm planning to do in Photoshop. And the second thing is to bring out those clouds so that they pop out from the scene a little bit more. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to right-click the image and I'm going to click on Edit, Edit in Photoshop. Now, while Photoshop is coming up, I just want to remind you that I am using my pen with a Wacom tool. And the reason why I'm doing that is when I know that I need to edit a, an image in Photoshop, it's so much more convenient to use the pen, especially when I start doing things like dodging and burning, a pen is irreplaceable. So normally, if I'm just editing, editing images in Lightroom, I will not be using a pen, I'll just rely on the keyboard and a mouse or a touchpad, and those work just fine. However, every time when I need to use the brush tool, this is going to be a much better way to do it because I can control uh, the uh, brush size and also can control how much sensitivity there is in the brush. The more I apply pressure to it, the more it's going to draw. So those kind of things, unfortunately, you cannot do with a mouse. Now, the image is open. I'm gonna go ahead and maximize Photoshop. Now with the haze removal, I'm going to rely on software called Nick Software, and it has a specific plugin called Nick Software Viveza, which does a very good job with removing haze. So let's go ahead and go to Nick Collection Viveza 2, and this is really good software. I'll show you what it does and its power in a second, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and select it at control point, and what I'm gonna do is start here from the left side of the scene, and I'm going to kind of start from here, make all my settings with these sliders, and then just simply duplicate that effect to the right side of the scene so that I can reduce that haze in the distance. So one of the things that I normally start with is reducing brightness, and as you can see, as I reduce the brightness, it is actually helping reduce that, that haze just because it's getting a little bit darker. Haze by itself, kind of looks, you know, cloudish white. So as you reduce the brightness, it certainly will help. The next thing you wanna do is increase contrast. As you can see, if I push contrast, you don't wanna be pushing it too much because then it's going to make it look very unreal here. So you wanna be pushing it maybe to something like 30 or so. Another slider that certainly helps is blue. Now in this case, I do have some blue and obviously this line of evergreen doesn't have as much blue. But again, it was shot in the morning. My white balance is set to be a little bit more blue. That's kind of my preferred look. 
So I didn't want to change that. And what, what I can do now though, is I can selectively reduce that blue in the evergreen. As you can see, as I start to reduce it, it's becoming more green. Now, obviously I do not want to have that green look because that doesn't look very good. So I'm going to reduce blue just a tad, maybe at most by uh, minus 10%. Now, let's take a look at the before and after. I'm gonna click on this preview check mark. As you can see, the difference is drastic. Just in that one area alone, the amount of haze that I was able to reduce is very significant. So if I click on duplicate now, I should be able to take exactly the same pointer and now move it to other areas that I want this haze reduced on. So I'm just going to reduce that area just a little bit, duplicate it more, push it out to this area right here, just make sure that each time you do it, you put it in a more or less consistent area where there is haze. And you know, I'm selecting these specific darker areas because as you can see, the effect will change significantly depending on where I locate it. And that's kind of the nice thing about these uh, Nick software tools is that they apply to specific colors and it doesn't go everywhere else. So let's go ahead and duplicate that. And this time I'm going to move it to this evergreen area here in the distance, maybe make it just a tad bigger. And then I'm just going to keep on moving it until I get to the far right side. So maybe instead of putting it over there, I'm gonna put it right here. Once again, just around, maybe reduce it smaller. And then one more and push it over here. In fact, in this case, I don't need to put it on the right side. That's should be good enough to cover the whole area. Now, one thing that happened here is I use this tool. If I go ahead and click on preview, look at what's happening. Although it is reducing the haze in the distance, it's also touching my foreground and it's touching those green trees here, which is not something I want. And in such situations, you want to be very careful using this tool because this selection right here, unfortunately, because that line of evergreen in the background somewhat matches the greens here, it's also affecting these greens here. Now, if I start painting one by one and start doing so many different objects, it's just going to take me a lot of time. Instead, what I can do is I can click on add control point, and if I just click on the areas that I do not want the haze tool to affect, then it's going to reset that. As you can see, I just reset it on that tree, and now it's not going to affect that tree by itself. So I'm just gonna make it small enough now to affect that. And the same thing I'm gonna do with these trees here. So as you can see, just got them reset. So I have to be a little bit careful about how I use this tool, but you know, in, in this case, this is working out fairly well. And maybe for this tree, I'm just going to make it very small and just duplicate that across the tree. So every image is going to be different. Just keep this in mind as you work with different images. But um, if you see that the tool is affecting some other areas of the scene that you do not want touched, then you have to do this, unfortunately. But still, the goal is to reduce the haze, which in this case, it's working out fairly well in my opinion. So maybe this one I'll just put right here in the center, make it a little bit bigger, make one more, and then just, as you can see, the greens here in the tree are getting affected pretty significantly. So at this point, let's take a look at the before and after. Preview, before, and after. And as you can see, the difference is huge. In fact, the tree line hasn't been touched almost at all, while the background here is getting tons of that haze reduced. And that was kind of my plan initially using the Viveza tool, and I think it worked out really well. So let's go ahead and click OK now. And right now Photoshop is applying that on a new layer and let's take a look again if I click on the eye here to turn it on and turn it off. Uh, the foreground here hasn't really been touched all that much. The trees are still the same way, but then the background it has a lot less haze. So again, I, that's something that I can work on more and I can reduce that blue, but if I do that, then I get into the danger zone because then I can make the image look a little bit more fake. Blue is normal, especially sunrises and sunsets, so I, I am intending to keep some of it in the scene. 
Uh, another thing that I just noticed in the image is that take a look at this left side right here. It is still, I don't know if it's vignetting or just the clouds themselves appeared a bit too dark on the left side of the frame. That's another thing that I can fix. And I'm going to go ahead and fire up Viveza one more time. And the reason why I don't do too many edits in one screen every single time is because uh, sometimes you want to do selective things that you want to work on and then come back and do more things later. Otherwise, you're going to run into the same issue where uh, one of the select added points might be affecting something else in the scene. So if you want to work on the sky, then it's better to work on the sky separately than say something on the foreground. So in this case, that's the reason why I have Viveza fired up again. Now, again, this side is not something that I'm a big fan of, so I'm gonna select that side, maybe reduce that uh, control point a little bit and add a little bit of more brightness here just so that it doesn't look as if uh, that was vignetting from the lens. And this side looks actually fairly decent, so I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Another thing that I wanna do is, like I said earlier, point um, on the uh, sky itself, I want to make the sky pop out more. And the nice thing about Viveza is that it has a built-in to tool to do that, very similarly as I showed you before, where you can just create a control point or add a control point to the area that you want, and then you can move the sliders and add things like structure to the clouds, which will make them pop. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna go ahead and click Add Control Point, and then I'm going to maybe start working right here in the center. Reduce the size just a little bit so that I'm not affecting the uh, uh, any of the surroundings. And what I'm going to do is reduce the brightness just a little bit, maybe just by um, minus eight or minus 10 or so. And then structure is what is going to bring those clouds out. Now, look, take a look at this. As I push it, obviously you don't wanna be pushing it too extreme to the right because then it's going to look very dirty and ugly. And the last thing I want is to make that um, in this image. So I'm going to reduce it maybe to something like around 30 or so. And as I make it there, if I start moving that control point, you can see what type of effect it's going to have in the clouds. As you can see, they are popping out from the scene. In fact, uh, these darker areas are popping out uh, compared to the background, especially when I start moving it over there. So I am going to keep that structure. Now, another thing I want to do is maybe just add a little bit, a little bit of color because I know I have some yellow here, but it's not enough. So what I can do is just work with warmth and as I move it to the right, that's really bad, obviously. So I need to be really careful about how much warmth I add to the sky. So maybe just add a little bit, something like 10% or so. Um, and you know, in some images, you'll see that if you're working with the sky and you have some pink in the clouds, you can actually go into this tool and just use the red slider and move it to the right a little bit. Again, you have to be very careful. You don't wanna be putting too much red in the sky, but you, if you already have some, it will enhance the color. So in this case, uh, you know what? It's actually looking a bit too yellow for my taste. So I'm just going to tone it down to maybe something like plus 10. And at this point, I'm just going to duplicate it, move it to the right, and just do the same thing until I hit the rest of that cloud. So right now it's adding a structure and a little bit of that warmth to the image. Uh, let's do the same thing right here at the top and maybe just around here. And the last one, maybe move it over here. Now, I definitely do not want to add anything here because I don't have much structure in there. In fact, let's just uh, give it a quick shot. If I add it there and move the structure to the right, as you can see, there's really not much going on here because it's more of a blue area of the sky. So I don't wanna be touching that. And let's go ahead and delete that. Um, but I, I did end up adding quite a bit of color in the sky. In fact, here on the right side, that warmth is actually not looking very good. So let me actually uh, bring it down to something like five on the right side here, because the last thing I want is too much color. Whoops, definitely not 50. And maybe reduce this to five as well, just so that it looks a little warm, um, but not too warm. And then maybe here, let's drop it down to something like eight. All right, let's take a look at the before and after. If I click on the preview, as you can see, that's a pretty drastic difference. You know, I've added uh, quite a bit of structure to the clouds and uh, you know, fix this side of the screen, 
uh, definitely looks much better now in my opinion. And then um, there is a little bit of blue here, so I have to be very careful about how, how much I want to continue using this tool. Now the nice thing about this is once I click OK, if I'm not happy with what I've done, I don't necessarily have to go back and undo anything because remember in Photoshop everything is layers. So I can go back to the layer itself and if I'm not happy with the changes, I can just tone down on that opacity bring it down just a little bit so that the image looks more natural. So let's take a look at the before and after overall, uh, what we had before with this image. And as you can see, that is actually a pretty big difference. And maybe, you know what, it's, I feel like it's a bit too much right now. So I'm just gonna tone it down to something like 60%. And I think that looks a bit better now. Perfect. All right, so two things that I've already done that I had in mind in the beginning. One is reduce haze, which I was able to do very quickly using that Nick software of Iveza. And then the second part was bringing out the clouds, which again, using the same tool, I was able to do that, which is already good. What's the next step from here? The first thing I'm going to work on is contrast because I do want to make the image pop a little bit more. Then after that, I will work on dodging and burning. And lastly, I want to work on local sharpening or selective sharpening. All right, so from here, I think 60% works pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and merge these two because I really don't need to have access to uh, the layer separately and just one uh, layer by itself is going to be good enough. The next step, as I said, is I'm going to work on contrast. Now, one thing in Photoshop, especially if you're just starting out, if you don't really have a reference to how much contrast there is already in your image, sometimes this tool can help tremendously, believe it or not. But if you go to image and just click on auto contrast, it will be a good reference point for you because if you see a big change, then you know that maybe there is a need for added contrast. And in many cases, just clicking on that will give you a visual guidance. And uh, Photoshop has its own algorithm to how it does it. If you have plenty of contrast in an image already, it should literally do nothing. But if you see some, uh, you know, some brightness in the image and some contrast added, then you know that the image potentially might need more contrast. So in this case, let's take a look at the before and after. I'm gonna go back one step and go forward. And as you can see, there is a very, very subtle change, which shows me that there is potential for some contrast. And that's not the only reason why I'm doing it too. I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking, well, I could use a little bit of contrast in this image in addition to uh, the dodging and burning. Now with the dodging and burning, as I'll show you in a second, my idea is to bring out certain parts of the image and then tone down other parts of the image so that I can guide the viewer's eye to the most important parts of my image. And in this case, my primary subject is the patriarch tree. That's what I want to do here. When it comes to adding contrast, Photoshop has a number of different tools built in to do that, but I'm just going to use the curves adjustment layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on curves and this brings up the curves here. And there are a number of different ways you can work with the curves, but if you want to have kind of a good um, Starting point, the linear contrast is just a straight up S curve, which boosts brightness and reduces the shadows. And as you can see, the effect of that is pretty drastic and it's actually way too much for my taste. So uh, just because it's affecting the shadows here way too much. So I'm just going to bring them right back up, maybe just around here. And then with the brightness, I'm going to slightly reduce it. And let's take a look at the before and after. As you can see, it's a very subtle change, but it's definitely there. So another thing to keep in mind is take a look at what it's doing to the sky. It's also affecting the sky, which is not necessarily what I want in this image. So if you want to exclude that, you've got the mask right here. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, let's close out of that. Uh, select the brush tool B and with that selected and the black paint, um, I'm going to start working on it. Now my uh, brush size is about 500 pixels and hardness is set to zero, which is the one I want. And the opacity right now is set to 100, which is a bit too much. So let's just go ahead and reduce it to maybe something like 75%. Even 75% can be a bit too much. But in this case, uh, you know, I'm just going to do a very rough job by trying to eliminate that top sky. In fact, you know what? A better way to do this, rather than try to paint it over, uh, just because I have a clear definition of the mountains here, is just to use a very simple quick selection tool. I think that's going to be a better job, or that's gonna do a better job. So let's go ahead and select that. And look at that, that's actually pretty good. And that just completely selected the whole sky. So from this, all I have to do is just right click and say fill, 
and let's just fill it with black. And look at that. Instead of trying to paint it over and spend time doing that, I just saved myself a lot of different clicks. And now I've got that uh, mask which completely covers the sky and excludes that. So now if I uncheck and check back, I've got contrast throughout the image and definitely not in the sky. And that's kind of what I wanted. Now at this point, I've got contrast in the image. It's looking pretty good. I don't think I want to add anything else to the image or try to take care of any other uh, issues in the image because I really don't see them. So the next step is to do dodging and burning. For dodging and burning, I'm just going to go ahead and hold on the Alt button and then click on the new layer. And I'm going to select the overlay mode, fill the overlay with 50% gray, click OK. And as you can see, that's a transparent layer. Now, one thing to keep in mind, when you do dodging and burning, you have to be very careful about how much dodging and burning you're going to be applying to the image. Because if you darken some areas too much or brighten your primary subject, for example, too much, it's going to look fake and it's not going to look as if it's part of the scene. So one thing that you want to tone down on immediately is your opacity. Now, if I don't do that, let's just pre pretend that I'm gonna do something like 75%. Well, if I have have my white selected would, would mean, which would mean that I'm uh, dodging at this point. And look at what's going to happen. That's way too fake and not good. So I'm gonna go ahead and undo that. And same thing if I were to switch colors and try to do burning, just way too much. So 75% is definitely not gonna cut it. I'm gonna reduce it to 3% um, or sometimes between two to 4% is where I usually stay at. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to brighten up the tree and maybe darken up, uh, darken some of these trees in the background, especially this guy right here, and then maybe tone down the background just a little bit. So let's see what we can do with this. I'm going to go ahead and switch the colors so that I have the whites and this is going to be for my foreground. Let's reduce that size of the brush. And I'm just going to start painting these areas right here. And very subtle adjustments, as I said earlier. All I wanna do is just bring out the tree compared to the background. Right there. Good. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you what I've done so far. So if I um, do the before and after, as you can see by turning the layer on and off, it's very subtle, very, very subtle change here just to the tree. Now I am potentially overpainting painting these areas here a little bit, which is really not that big of a deal to be honest, because we can't really see that much of it. So um, I'm going to tone these down a little bit, switch to burning and just tone these guys down a tad because I don't want them to have exactly the same brightness as the tree. There you go. And then obviously these guys here in the background and this guy especially. All right, so take a look before and after. As you can see, this got slightly darker, slightly brighter. And in fact, I'm going to increase the opacity just a little bit on just this guy alone here because I don't want him to uh, stand out that much. In fact, it shouldn't be that bright. Right there, I think it's gonna look much better. So as you can see, there was a little bit of even um, halo around it just uh, by using the VESA tool probably earlier, uh, which I was able to reduce. So let's go ahead and bring it down to three and I'm just going to do just around it a little bit more and that looks pretty good to me. Now, if you accidentally overdo it, you can just switch to the white tool and then, or switch the colors and just uh, undo what you've done by uh, repainting the other area and it should look a little bit better. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's really no clear way for you to start over. So every once in a while, if you do mess up, you might have to go back a step or two and uh, start over. But in this case, it's looking pretty decent, I think. Um, also, I do want to bring out this foreground maybe just a tad more. So I'm going to switch to my white by pressing the X key. And let's just dodge this foreground just a little bit. Skip the tree line here. And it's just going to be very, very subtle. All right, so let's take a look at the before and after. That's looking fairly decent. 
All right, and now the next step is to darken maybe just a little bit uh, this background here. So I'm just going to do the same thing, switch and start darkening that area. And as you can see, before actually, um, when I use the darken tool or when I use the um, Nick Viveza tool, I was able to uh, reduce that brightness and that actually helped me reduce that haze in the background. So with this step, I'm kind of doing something very similar and reducing that haze even more. All right, so that should be looking pretty good, I think. And I'm definitely not wanting to go over here and start messing with that because I actually like the brightness of that. All right, so this is the before, this is the after. I think that's looking much better now. Um, let's see, yep, that's looking much better. In fact, there was a little bit of white in here. Look at that, it's, uh, it's actually did a pretty decent job with taking care of that. And um, the haze here is now looking much more controlled. So my uh, step with the dodging and burning is pretty much done. Now, if, once again, if you don't like the setting, there's always the opacity tool that you can use. So you can tone it down. If I'm not happy with this, I can just tone it down to something like 50% or 75%, whatever I like. In this case, I think uh, the difference is very subtle, but good enough for me to, to keep these changes. So I should be fairly happy with the result. The last step is sharpening. Now keep in mind that I've already applied sharpening to this image in Lightroom. And if you remember, I even used a masking tool to so that it selectively sharpens only the areas that I intended to sharpen. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that in Photoshop right now, I don't need to go through that extra step. However, if I were to export this image to the web, say for Facebook or for any other reason, then I would most likely be reducing the image to a lower resolution. And the moment I do that, I absolutely have to apply output sharpening. Now, after I save the image in Photoshop, I could go back to Lightroom and export it in any size and then apply output sharpening, which would work just fine. However, if you want to do it in Photoshop, let me show you a way that works really well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hit Command Option I, which brings up the image size, and I'm going to set the width of the image to 1200 pixels. Now, as I do this, I do have the option right here for the resampling method, and typically it's set to automatic. Now, whenever you reduce an image, if you set it to bicubic sharper, what it will do is as it down samples the image and makes it smaller, it will add a little bit of sharpening to the image. So depending on what type of sampling method you use, you might need to add more or less sharpening. Typically, I just go for bicubic sharper. So I'm gonna go ahead and select OK now. Now, as I did this, as you can see, the image is now much smaller in size. I'm going to go ahead and increase it to 100% size. So here you can see that it's still looking pretty sharp and that's the result of that sampling methodology because I'm using something where it's reducing it and it's also uh, reducing it so that it becomes sharper after the reduction process. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another level of sharpening on top of that. And I'm going to use, again, uh, Nick Collection tools just because they're, I can do that much quicker and I have that selective sharpening capability built in. So let's go ahead and do that. But before I do that, I need to first gather all the layers and bring them into a single layer because that's the one that I'm going to be working on. And the crazy command for that is going to be Command Option Shift E. And as you can see, everything is merged now into one single layer. So this is not something that I'm intending to keep. In fact, I'm going to undo these changes and uh, so that I preserve my original file and not even save this image because the last thing I want is everything that I've done is reduced to now a very small resolution and I definitely do not want to save it. But just to keep this in mind, if you haven't done sharpening in Lightroom and you're doing it within Photoshop, then this last layer is going to override everything on the bottom here. So if you do need to make changes to any of the bottom layers here, you will need to throw this away, basically undo your sharpening step and then make changes to these layers, then recreate that layer and start over. So so um, that is unfortunate, but that's the way that you have to work with in this situation if you want to um, use a plugin like I do here. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Raw Pre-Sharpener. And here I've got uh, a couple of options. I've got the different uh, sharpening. I've got 
the adaptive sharpening and then I can sharpen the areas or the edges. I usually leave this in the middle and with adaptive sharpening, look at what's going to happen right here. In fact, I'm going to uh, go ahead and use maybe this area where there's a transition line between the tree and the mountain, maybe just lower down just a little bit. Where you want to look at is the edges here and also the tree itself. So it's set to 30% right now, which is actually doing quite a bit of sharpening already, which is looking nice. But the last thing you want is at too much sharpening. As, as, as you can see, the more I push it, the uglier it looks. First of all, I get all these really weird halos here, and then it's just not looking good. So I'm going to tone it down. Usually I keep it after doing uh, the, the um, resampling, especially with the reduction method I just showed you earlier, I usually keep it right around 30% or maybe 35% at most. So let's just do about 30%. And then uh, the image quality is set to normal. Uh, it's not a high ISO image, I'm not worried about that. Now, if I wanted to make sure that the sharpening only applies to the image and not to the sky, I can actually use selective sharpening right here. And then if I just click on the minus, which will exclude the areas, uh, let me show you how that looks. I'm going to actually boost it up to a really outrageous number. And uh, the way that the selective sharpening works, if I click on that minus, as you can see, and just select a control point, anywhere in, within that control point area, sharpening is not going to apply. So if I moved over here, as you can see, it's not applying to that tree. But you know, if I move it here, you can see how this is working. So one thing to keep in mind is that if you do want to exclude something, then you use this tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this back to 30, and now I'm just going to exclude the sky. So let's just do that. And uh, this tool works similarly to other tools uh, in Nick software um, package. So it should do a fairly good job. And I can just simply duplicate to and just move it around, maybe reduce it a little bit. So this tool works really well, and my recommendation would be definitely to use it in such situations where you need to selectively sharpen your image. And as you can see, it actually does a fairly good job. This is after and this is the before area, and sharpening that it's applying to is really good. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. So at this point, I just applied selective sharpening. Now, if you do not want to do that directly through the tool, the only reason why I do it is because it saves time. But in this case, I already have this mask, for example. I might just use the, the sharpening and not even go through the selective tool and simply apply the same mask to this layer right here. And by just doing that, I can exclude the sky completely. So just uh, play with your images. Whatever results in quicker and more efficient workflow is what I would recommend. So in this case, after I'm done, this image is looking really, really good. And the sharpening is also very good. If I zoom in to 200%, as you can see, it's looking really nice. If I go ahead and uncheck, and check that back. It's a very subtle change. Again, I have the ability to control this with opacity. So if I'm not happy with that, I can tone it down if I want to. But usually for the web, you want the images to look really good and this is definitely going to get me there. From here is just a matter of going to File, Export, Save for Web, and then you know set your target JPEG quality, make sure all the options are right. And once I save, this is going to be good to go to the web, as you can see, it looks really, really good. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel, and I'm definitely going to go back a few steps because I do not want to apply that sharpener setting, and especially the image size that I had before, so just going back to my previous step. In fact, I, I could just cancel out of it because I already saved it earlier, but let's just do save, and this is the full size image, close out of it, and I'm going to navigate back to Lightroom. This is the image that I've got. And let's now take a look at the before and after. I think it's a good time to do that. So the image on the right, I'm just going to shift select, go to develop module and just navigate to the right. This is the way that we uh, had it in Lightroom. And this is the way that it looks after I've made my tweaks in Photoshop. I'm gonna go ahead and hit tab. In fact, let's go full screen. And this is the before. This is the after, as you can see, the difference is very big. I was able to reduce a lot of that haze here compared to this image. And then the sky is also looking much nicer now. It's much more defined. The clouds are much more defined and the image overall has a more vibrant look. And as I 
wanted to, I brought out the tree a little bit more, made everything else a little bit darker, brought out the foreground a little bit, and then also darkened the background here. So I would say that the image looks pretty successful. I'm fairly happy with the result and that's about it.